Okay, we're here to do another show of Sovereign or Slave, and today we're going to delve into foreclosure issues once again. And today I have a guest with me who does mortgage uh, lending, and he's familiar with the uh, lending process. And we're going to talk about securitization. And securitization is a process that has is fairly recent in history because I don't believe that before 1990 that, they're, that they were doing securitizations, but I'm probably wrong. And so we are going to talk to Mr. Oak Tice. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I really appreciate that. I hope um, and I look forward to useful um, presentation and and uh, make sure that uh, uh, we covered basics uh, on the mortgage lending uh, that includes the securitization issues so uh, having said that and where does know. it all start Oak well that's a very good question um, it started in the 80s but securitization has always been part of the mortgage lending uh, processes. Um, but what happened is that uh, recently what you heard about uh, securitization, fraud, and other, other things that is going on right now is that um, the um, people who got into the securitization business I believe um, they had gotten too greedy in the process. Securitization process is a very good and useful process if it is done correctly because you're tapping into the uh, source of funds. Um, the more money comes in and the more loans and can be made and enable the uh, homeowners to purchase properties. Well, let's, uh, let's discuss what happens initially when, um, you know, Bob and Mary come in to buy a home. The first thing they do would be what? Well, let me, I think maybe I should explain that in a very simple terms, uh, going back the way it was. Um, husband and wife, and if they wanted to buy a house and they identify the property and then they said, well, okay, we need to purchase it at a certain price and we need a loan of X number of dollars. And um, they would normally go to the local bank and uh, sit down with them. And uh, this is going back to like 50 years or so. And the banker would look at them and analyze their financial situations and look at their character, capacity, um, and their credit ratings and ability to repay the loan. Look at their income, And the co expenses. common down payment at that time was 20%? The down payment was 20%, but you could, uh, you could buy a home with 5% down, FHA and... Uh, 50 years uh, ago? You could do that, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but there were safeguards at that time. So the banker, because they're local, because they know you, they're, they're, uh, I believe they used to be called unit banking system. Um, so you get your loan and then uh, you sign a note to the bank and um, the bank keeps the note in their vaults. That's their money. Now, of course, it is a little bit more complicated than that, but let's just say that it was their money. Mm -hmm. But they're the instruments of making these loans. But they used to keep the note in their well, possession. My father-in-law got his original note back when he paid off his house. That's right. And then you tell the bank banker and you say, well, look, we need to borrow this money. I will pay you back. And when I pay you back completely, in full, you give me my note back, I own my home. Otherwise, the note is like an IOU, and if he still keeps it, he can ask you to pay it. Exactly. And then, in addition to that, um, we give the bank uh, 
and other security instruments called the deed of trust that if I don't pay you back, you can take the property back and sell it, recover your money. That's just the way it was. It's a real simple system. Right. Uh, but eventually, uh, I don't want to sound bad on Wall Street people, but unfortunately they did real bad. Um, they got into this act and figured out, well, you know, why should we use the unit banking system and individuals go to the bank and borrow the money and buy their homes, and this is a very cumbersome system. Uh, had they not gotten too greedy about this. So um, they found a way, which I can get into details on this, to um, create a pool and they sold slices of interest in this pool to all kinds of investors, local or foreign investors, pension funds and, and uh, many other institutions bought into this. So the pool would have a thousand mortgages in it? No, pool basically um, was organized to keep money in there. It's just like your swimming pool. Instead of water, mm -hmm. you got a bunch of money in there. It could be a hundred million dollars, it could be a billion, five billion, whatever it is. It, it, it was determined by the, the entity formed this pool, namely like for example uh, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch and other uh, Wall Street institutions. Well was the money that was invested into the pool varied and comes from different sources or did it all come from mortgages? They, the pool was formed for the purpose of mortgages, used for that mortgage, uh, getting mortgages. But if you can imagine a blind pool, let's just say no mortgages there, but they started this pool called XYZ pool. And then they, uh, they said that the pool uh, is going to be capitalized at, um, let's just say, two billion dollars. And then they issued um, 10,000 certificates and they categorized each one of them. So they're shares. They're, they're shares. And then they sold each individual ones and then the entity formed this pool said to them, to the investors, that your return will be 5%, 6%, pretty well guaranteed. But the sinister part of this uh, event was that in most cases the organizers um, forming these pools, they knew the pool was going to fail or they made it that way. And then they took insurance against the default. From? from AIG, for example, is a very good example of that. They're which, the biggest uh, insurers, right? They're the biggest insurance company in the United States, among other insurance companies. So they took um, insurance against that. But the other thing they did is they grade the pool, credit rating, for example, from the um, agencies, um, Moody's and Fitch and others. Um, so there is a wrongdoing, apparently a wrongdoing there as well, that uh, when the insurance company knew or should have known that this pool were re was really designed to fail, but they gave a AAA rating. So it enabled the... Um, Even though the um, Goldman Sachs was betting with in, by insuring it because they didn't feel comfortable with it, that they insured it in so, so that if it did fail, they would get their insurance back. They would get their money back. Right. They knew it was going to in, uh, fail. And if you really get into the details of this, that many of the pools were designed to fail. Um, uh, now, I, I want to emphasize and they, they this. They were designed to fail because they were collections of very badly written mortgage. Well, the underwriting guidelines were very loose. 
For example, uh, you, uh, you could, uh, a borrower could go and get a 100% loan. Now, with a real bad credit rating, right. now you're not going to the bank in a traditional sense to borrow the money where the banker looks at you and then grades you based on your credit rating, your income, the real income. But the pools where the underwriting guidelines were specified in their documents, their either prospectus or, or the pooling and servicing agreements. In other words, some loans would be given out at um, where the, the borrower, they're fudging his income. I mean, you know, when they apply for it, they, they know that he doesn't have the kind of income and yet they put uh, false numbers in there anyway. And so they would have to, that with, you know, poor history, credit history and all these other issues, they must somehow have marked those loans as being, you know, designed to fail. Well, that's true. Uh, for example, the underwriting guidelines, one of them, uh, several of them really, was, were based on the credit rating of the borrower, for example. If your credit rating, for example, is over 650 FICO score, or I'm just making up this number, or maybe 700, then they allowed the borrowers to state their income and assets. I have seen dozens and dozens of cases where we look at the borrower, there's no way they could make $30,000 a month income. They're making $3,500 a month income. But because they had a good credit rating in order to qualify them for that mortgage, so you state their income at $30,000 a month. Unbelievable. There's no, nobody could believe that. But, but it was within the underlying, uh, underwriting guidelines. So having been a mortgage broker, uh, I've seen many, many cases that you had to state their income. And we, um, this, this is another issue that we uh, expressed our opinions to the underwriters at the bank's level, saying that these people do not qualify. But because of the programs and because they were under enormous pressure to push these loans, they directed us to state their income, and in many cases that they suggested certain sums of uh, money that they should be documented in their 1003 application forms so that they would qualify. And, and they there, were going to Is there to any reason why they would do that? I mean, there has to be some kind of financial well, benefit for them. The, the reason for that was that the pool was already sold out and they have $3 billion or whatever enormous amount of money in there that needed to be used for these mortgages. So they were pushing the money out to make loans as fast as they can, as many of them as they can, regardless of the outcome, because they already have an insurance. Okay, and where does this money get created from? I mean... Well, the money. Where, where does it originate from? The money, the money came from the investors that they sold these certificates to. It could be hundreds of people or thousands of people uh, overseas. Um, you heard a case in Iceland, and uh, I believe uh, they went bankrupt or they were really in financial problems, and they were pretty heavily invested in these mortgage-backed securities which turned out to be real it's bad. Odd. But the problem is, uh, the, uh, this is extremely complex, although it's a very simple process, but it's very complex in the way that they have uh, formed this and, and utilized the processes to um, originate loans that they were, I would say, fraudulent to start with. Well, well let's start uh, with, um you know, Bob and Mary come into the office and they've decided to pick out a home and they sign up uh, a loan application originally and then their loan application gets looked over and approved? Well, 
they were looked over and approved based on these exotic uh, mortgage programs. Okay, so then the, let's say they get their loan application approved. Who does it get submitted to? No, the, you're, you're talking about the origination process, uh, mortgage processing. Is that what you after said? after you go through the loan application? Well, it gets the application gets submitted to somebody, right? Who? Well, the the application is um, filled out, which is called a 1003 application. 1003 application form. It's a Fannie Mae form. It's a government originated form. It's a very good form, by the way. It has a lot of information that really um, tells you about the borrower. Uh, but you can put any information you want in there unless it is verified. And many of these were not verified. For example... Um, well, they would be filled the, out by the person borrowing or the person helping them to secure the loan? The uh, borrowers in, I would say, over 95% of the times did not or were not willing to fill out these applications. So themselves. they weren't going to lie about their... They weren't. They, uh, the mortgage broker, I filled out their applications in many cases in their presence. You know, we asked them because when you have a form that they're not familiar with, it's very difficult to fill out what if somebody has to guide them through. And I would ask them their names and addresses, you know, we fill it out. And then when it comes to the income uh, section, what is your income? Where is your ten uh, the um, W-2 forms and pay stubs? And we look at it. You know, it's all documented. You yeah. fill it out. As far as their assets and liabilities, you know, you run their credit reports. And these softwares that we had, when you run the credit report, all their liabilities are automatically filled in this application form. It's already pre-filled. So the, the softwares were very sophisticated. You can fill out all the information while you're interviewing the, applica uh, the applicant. It will automatically fill in the areas. The so they authorize a uh, credit report, and then the credit report gives the information to the software, and the software just fills the form out. Fills it out. It's, all, it's very easy to do. But then you review it with the b borrower and you give them copies and they take it home, they review it and they sign it and bring it back. And they didn't have to, they should, they should sign them, but they always sign them at the closing, you know. But um, we had forms and uh, authorization forms, you know, it's all, um, authorized to run their credit report okay. and then fill out the applications and, and so on. But the problem area was the, the on the assets, liquid assets sides, how much money they have in the bank, what their income was. Well, that's where it's stated. It was allowed. The, the programs that the, the uh, Wall Street people already designed uh, allowed a stated income, stated asset programs, or no income, no asset programs. So, so how do you feel? What do you do? And you look at the loan amount they're they're getting, and then they there are some ratios. They call them front ratios and back ratios. Like, you have the mortgage payment, principal, interest, you know, taxes, insurance. It should be within a certain ratio of your total income. Yeah, it used to be 25 percent, and then they boosted 28 percent to like 35 percent and 40. Well, if you look at their real income, and you look at the front ratio, it may come up to 60 percent. These people do not qualify for this loan, but because of the pressure, because of the uh, availability of these programs designed to fail stated income. So what income should they have to bring that ratio down to 28%? You know, simple calculations. And you find that maybe they need to make $9,000 a month income. So you put in $9,000 a month income. Now, is this a fraud? Is this what, well, it's a wrong information, but it, it, it was allowed. 
This right. was the it's program. With, it's within the guidelines. Within the guidelines. And, and many times that we call the underwriters uh, of, of the lender and say, these people have, you know, they don't have enough income. So what do we do? What, what, what? Well, many, many times they would calculate the income and say, well, put in $9,500 or whatever. Or sometimes that we send the documents over to them and they would correct it and send it back to us so we would redo it. So, but they've come and they've filled out the loan application and now they are um, sending that application off to the bank or to uh, a broker well, who's going to submit it to an originator who's going to provide the funds and, you know, who's providing the funds? Well, the, it's not only one application form you fill out. There are many other forms that's filled out. Authorization form and credit reports, the 1003 form, 1008, the trans underwriting transmittal forms. There, there's a lot of them, disclosures and so on. They're all packaged together, and the borrower always sign the... Um, 4506T form for tax which, returns. For tax returns that gives the lender author uh, the authorization to get their actual income from the IRS, but the lenders did not. Many many cases did not follow up on that because it was stated income, mm -hmm. even though there was a 4506T form. So this, the whole entire package went to the underwriters, at the lenders level. And the lenders are Wells Fargo, They're Bank of originators, America, Wells countrywide. Fargo, Countrywide, uh, yes. B big players that are right. doing, and how many big players are there like that, like under 10? Well, I would say so, under, under 10, or you, you can count them, let's say. Uh, but under that, there are many, many originators, you know, and many like mortgage companies and their local mortgage companies. What the uh, lenders, I shouldn't even call them lenders really because it wasn't their money. They're not, they were intermediaries. Wells Fargo, I'm talking about Bank, Bank of America. Of America and they, were, they, were, they weren't the lenders. They didn't use their money to loan to the, to the borrowers. Okay. Uh, but under them, they created enormous amount of sub-lenders. Uh, but they're called, these people, they would orig they're originators, but they originated the loans and they were table funding the loans. In other words, they were closing the loans on their own names, but using Wells Fargo, the money came from Wells Fargo, which wasn't Wells Fargo's money, they had money somewhere else coming in, and they forward the money to the escrow company and then they fund the loan. So, so where would the for, Wells Fargo get the money to give to their... From the pool. From the pool. So, so Wall Street would create the pool, sell the shares, generate the funds, and then give those funds to the bank. Right. Just look at it this way. They created the pool. They got a ton of money in there. Now it's got to be used. So then they they, they uh, got the Countrywide, the Wells Fargo, Bank of America, all these big players. And then underneath them, the other players. And then the money did not go directly to these people, but it went through a warehouse lending processes. You know, they, they got warehouses. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, for example, may have another entity there that they how, warehouse the money. All that money through electronic transfers, you know, if you need to be funding a loan here, it would go from the, um, the warehouse line of credit to uh, one of these players and then the next one and it goes to escrow and then the escrow would fund the loan. Now, how do you how do, how would you know that? How would you know where the money is coming from? You sit down, and well, you your belief is that it's coming from the from Cal Bay Mortgage, your local lender. Who exactly you, you, that you sat in front of the table with them. 
That's correct. And it's and in note, you give them a note, it says that I owe X number of dollars to Cal Bay Mortgage. But the title company or the escrow, they had the evidence where that money was coming from. It wasn't coming from Cal, Cal Bay. Bay. It was coming from another Wells warehouse Fargo. line of credit somewhere else. This was not disclosed to the borrower. What would have happened if it were disclosed to the borrower? Then the borrower would want to make his payments to the person who was supplying the money. I would assume that they would want to question that. They would say, well, where is this money coming from? But perhaps, you know, the borrower, you know, logically speaking, the borrowers, you know, they want the money, they want to buy this house. So why would they question where the money is coming from? 99% of the times, nobody questioned that. They're only worried where the money's coming from to buy the new drapes they want to put in. That's right. So Cal Bay uh, is, is the uh, uh, beneficiary there, for example. You write the note to Cal Bay. Who cares where that money was coming from? So they got it. And, but the system, the originators of the system, they knew what they were doing. They got the money. They used the money through the channels of the Big Play, Countrywide, Wells Fargo, and so on. And then they dispersed the money through the um, available escrow title services and funded the loan. And they got the borrowers to sign the note in the name of the originator. And then the originator took the note and the deed of trust transfer it over to the uh, seller, like, for example, Bank of America or Wells Fargo, or went over to them, or Countrywide. And then they took all these notes and, and, and mortgages, and, and then they transferred over to another entity they well, created. Well, they would have to endorse the note. That's another issue. You get into the legality of this, but I'm talking about the process. Um, so they transfer these documents, note and the deed of trust. These are the two, along with the others, but those are the two most important documents. Went to the um, Wells Fargo or P of A. These are the sellers. And then they created another entity, the depositor. You know, they made it bank bankruptcy remote. And then it went to um, another entity, the trust, the pool itself, went in there. Now the money went out and then replaced with the note and the deed of trust. Of course, then you get into the uh, agreements. How are these trusts are handled, or governed by? There are certain laws that usually the, the New York trust laws that govern these. these um, and the trustee trust. for the pool has certain duties and obligations. There's certain duties and there's servicers, master servicers and, and the other the, the servicers, primary servicers, um, they service the loans. But now, um, when you really look at this overall situation, um, if everything went well, everybody was happy, nobody would ask questions, you know, but now things are not as good as expected. So the borrowers are failing to make mortgage payments. There's a lot of default and um, these trusts are calling in uh, on their insurance policies. They're getting paid. They're foreclosing on these homeowners. And AIG which they already got went paid. bankrupt in 2008. And then the, the government, the public bailed them out, paying off these mortgages, whereas the borrowers are still making payments, or if they didn't make payments, they're foreclosed upon. And these are sold. Well, and if so, the government's going to step in and bail out AIG for issuing insurance to cover the, uh, to the investors who, um, what, if you invest in something, isn't that a risk? You're really, you know, you're really just giving money to the fat cats who are saying that everything is triple A rated when they should be losing everything they have. If the government's going to bail out anybody, it would be if you're going to pay off the mortgages, then shouldn't the people that are living in the houses 
get this to keep them? I mean, why should you pay off the insurance policy on the homeowner not making the payment to the benefit of the person who was taking a gamble that the stock they were buying was going to pay off, rather than the homeowner who is, uh, you know, his gamble was that he would keep his job and be able to make his payments. Well, that is true, what you're saying. This is where the le legal issues come in right now. And um, it, it, to me, what this is, um, in its simple, simplest terms, is a perfect planning of a perfect crime. Is it a criminal act? You know, I'm not a lawyer, of course I can't, I don't want to be judgmental on this thing here. But I'm just offering spiritual advice. The, well, um, <laughs> no legal advice here. The, uh, if, I mean, when you're looking at, if, if you have a mortgage situation and then the Wall Street firms or the trust got paid through insurance, should that not be accredited to the uh, benefit of the homeowners? Right. It should be. Well, and oftentimes but the homeowner if they weren't putting 20% down, they had to pay mortgage insurance. That's right. They so if you're paying insurance, doesn't you don't insure somebody else, you only insure yourself. But, but these were all created for the benefit of the lenders. Now when I say lenders, well they're not the real lenders anyway, it wasn't their money. The real lenders really are the, the certificate holders, the investors who funded these pools. Now, there are thousands and maybe millions of them that they have a little slice of your mortgage or my mortgage. How are they going to foreclose on me? I don't pay on that small amount. See, this is all pre-planned. It's all designed well, so that maybe, uh, you call, is it a plausible deniability? Absolutely. That, you, you know, in the... Uh, the the Wall Street people could say, well, it wasn't our fault. It's the mortgage broker, or it's the other people down the stream, you know, that caused all these fraudulent activities. Okay, this is uh, an example of the securitization. And would you like to discuss it? Oh, yes. Um, this one is a is one of the examples that. Um, not only it shows the processes that the loan went through, but also the uh, screw-up, I call that. Um, this is a pretty serious situation here. I think uh, eventually that we will get into the position where we will be able to talk about the legality of this thing here, how the court system sees these. I think, Jeff, you will have a lot of other questions about that when we get to that point. But just for the sake of discussion, let's just follow this steps in steps here to see what happened. For example, this loan was originated June 16, 2003, and the lender here is Flagstar Bank, which is one of the originators. Flagstar Bank is not as big as Bank of America or Wells Fargo, but they are originators. You know, it's a bank. So, so on the deed of trust, they are listed as the lender. The, on the note and the deed of trust, they're listed as the lender. Okay. So the note was originated in June 16, 2003. The, the um, Flagstar Bank is the um, beneficiary. And of course, the own homeowner is the um, the borrower. Trust and then, borrower slash settler or trustor. Under the deed of trust, is they're the trustor, and also MERS is shown here as the nominee for the beneficiary. Again, this is another issue that is subject matter that could be discussed. In how can Flagstar Bank be the beneficiary and MERS be the nominee? Well, this is what they did. They created MERS, Mortgage Electronic Registration System. It's, it's nothing more than uh, tracking these mortgages electronically through the maze of these 
securitization steps. And another example of why or how they deceive the public. Because when the mortgage travels through the securitization process, every time the mortgage or deed of trust has been transferred to somebody else or note is endorsed and sold, they have to be recorded. This process has to be recorded in the counter recorder's office. But through MERS... So if somebody's looking up records, they can find out who is the responsible party at that point. Correct. But with MERS, you'll never know that unless you're a member bank and then you can look up MERS records and it, MERS will show you where the uh, deed of trust is and how it was transferred. But let's just go um, to the next step. The loan was originated at a local... A title company or escrow and then the Flagstar Bank is the um, the lender of record so it appears that Flagstar Bank funded this loan what in actuality this loan was funded through where it says there CSFE mortgage back pass through certificates that is the pool that pool had so much money in there and part of that money was used to fund this loan. Did it go to Flagstar Bank? No. It went to the, lend, uh, the, the uh, warehouse lender um, or warehouse lender assigned for, for the Black, uh, uh, Flagstar Bank which funded this loan. How do we know this? Uh, you have to you have to look at the records of the title company and find out where that money came from, which never, by the way, they, they never disclosed that to you. So you can request that information from the title you company? You can request that, and they will not give it to you unless you subpoena them or go through the discovery process. In, in a court case? In a court case, correct. Why don't they do that? Well, that was the process. I mean, it didn't matter where that money came from. Uh, but again, if you look at the legality of this thing here, and not being a lawyer, of course, I'm just using my own opinion here, is that Flagstar Bank says that I loan you the money. Is it really their money? Where is their record to show me that Flagstar Bank actually loaned the money to the borrower? And if they didn't loan it, how would they have the right to get collect. it back, collect on it? That's right. So. Eventually, Flagstar Bank sold or transferred that loan to Washington Mutual. Now, where's the evidence? If I go to a counter recorder's office, you will only find one item recorded there is that deed of trust recorded to Flagstar Bank. You'll never find anywhere anything that says that Flagstar Bank transferred this deed of trust to Washington Mutual unless you go through the uh, MERS records, which is not public. Now, one of these entities, either Flagstar Bank or Washington Mutual, securitized this loan. I suspect that it was the Flagstar Bank. How do I know that? It's because if you look at the uh, cutoff date of the trust, if you go down, you'll find the cutoff date is 1 December 1st, 2003. That's where the, and then the closing date is December 29, 2003. So based on the pooling and servicing agreement that governs this trust, all these loans would have to be deposited into this trust by the cutoff date, December 1st, but no later than December 29, 2003. And this loan was originated in June 2003, so it took them six months, or not six months, but whatever, five months to get there. The trust... Now, there's, it says more sellers. You see, here's where the trust, if you look at the, these, these items came from the pooling and servicing agreement. Uh, if you look at it, you will see that the trustee for this trust is J.P. Morgan Chase. And then you look down, uh, Washington Mutual 
was one of the servicers. And then down below that, WMMSC, which is which stands for Washington Mutual Mortgage Securities Corporation, that securitized one of the sellers. Wells Fargo Bank is another seller. And uh, sorry, Wells Fargo Bank was the master servicer and also custodian for this trust. So they would the custodian would keep the, the deed, of, deed of trusts that were submitted to it and the promissory and the notes. notes. The original and they'd have thousands of them. Correct. And then Credit Suisse First Boston Securities Corporation, which is CSFB, is the depositor. That is the trust. And the trustee was the J.P. Morgan Chase. So now, um, if you look back, you see J.P. Morgan Chase is the trustee and, and the servicer. So if you go up and a how, little bit. And how does uh, FDIC, FDIC come into that? FDIC got into the act is because Washington Mutual went under. FDIC took over, and FDIC make a de made a deal with J.P. Morgan Chase, and they sold or transferred all the Washington Mutual assets to the um, um, J.P. Morgan Chase, and that's why FDIC is listed there as a as a uh, another party that is responsible, or or party of the securitization b uh, processes here. Right here, one, one thing that I want to mention is that the question is, who would be the, con uh, the foreclosing party on this property? Well, the only one authorized to foreclose is the lender. And the lender is? Lender is the person who's named on the deed of trust, which was um, Flagstar, Flagstar Bank. Bank. They are the only ones that are named, and they are the only ones that would be authorized. That is correct. That is correct. If they loan their money. Right. The, but they are the, they're the lender of record based on the note. But, but in on actual, the deed of trust, they would be the only ones that, that could would, foreclose. They, if they had the deed of trust and the note together, then they would be the ones that had the right to foreclose and no one else but them. But them. So if this property was to be foreclosed upon, how would that, how would that happen? The, they would... Um, but the note now is in the trust and the deed of trust supposedly there. So the trust owns the note. Well, it has rights to the note. I doubt that it actually has possession of the note. Let's assume that they do. They have to. Or l l l they're well, then they right. would have to be an assignment to them so Let that they would have the rights, and then they would have to have a chain of title showing that the, the deed and the promissory note were never separated and that were assigned to them. Correct. And so that, you they, that money transferred hands, they bought it, and, uh, and then they would retain the right to uh, foreclose. Foreclose. So in other words, the trust is the owner of the note. Assuming that the uh, note was endorsed and properly transferred, and the deed assigned, of trust, yes. as, uh, and the deed of trust, uh, they assigned properly and recorded. Right. Uh, then, if they want to foreclose, they would they would assign the uh, the deed of trust back to the um, uh, Flagstar Bank, and then. Or they would have had they, to have recorded at the county recorders an assignment, a proper assignment that they had purchased the note and the deed and that they were the new um, lender. Right. But, but in other words, Flagstar Bank would have to foreclose on that, but in order for them to foreclose, there has to be some type of a substitution of trustee from the trust to Flagstar Bank. And then Flagstar Bank would foreclose through MERS. MERS is the benefit is the nominee for the beneficiary. Well, actually, no. MERS would have no authority to foreclose as nominee unless they uh, were assigned. I know, but okay. let, we're assuming that everything is done correctly. That this is the process that you would have to go through. Right. But look what happened. If you move over to the right, all of a sudden, 
There comes another trust here. It's called MALT 2004-1 trust. That's Master Adjustable Rate Mortgages Trust 2004-1. That is another pool, just like the one that we just talked about, Credit Suisse Trust. And um, in here, it shows the um, uh, UBS Real Estate Securities as a transfer, Wells Fargo Bank um, as the master servicer and custodian. J.P. Morgan Chase is a trustee. So J.P. Morgan Chase was the trustee for both of these trusts. Well, it's nice to be boss, you know. Let's just be trustee of, of everything in the world. Okay. <laughs> but now you go down a little bit, but look at the cutoff date, January 1st, 2004. So this note had to be in there before January 1st, if, if it was in there. I just happen to know that we did a loan level analysis and we did the securitization analysis and audit for this particular loan and we found that this loan was not in this MALT 2004-1. It was in the Credit Suisse Trust but not in this MALT here. So, so what they JP did... JP Morgan Chase as trustee would have no authority to act because the loan was not under their care as a trust, in their, in their trust. In this MALT, uh, they did have the authority for Credit Suisse. But not, but over, not, this, on this not over this loan. Right. So the borrower defaulted, and then there was a notice of default issued on February 26, 2010 by California reconveyance, you know, as the trustee. And then, and then you'll find the same date, February 26, 2010, same date, assignment of the deed of trust. It says the deed of trust was assigned to U.S. National Bank uh, Associated the trustee, and they were the successor interest of Wachovia Bank, and trustee for 2004, which they were assigned all the beneficial interests together with the note and the security thereby. So this particular note, together with the deed of trust... Well, wait a minute. Was the assignment recorded? This was recorded in the counter recorder's office. Here. That U.S. National Bank was association was assigned at, to be trustee. This is the exact recorded documentation summary okay. in, the record, in the recorder's office. And this was signed by Deborah Brignac, vice president, who is also a robo-signer. How do I know that? And well, why don't you, we talk about what a robo-signer uh, is? A robo-signer is the person, uh, person who signs thousands of these things in one day without really having first-hand knowledge of the true aspects of the underlying note and the deed of trust and the default condition of the loan. And gen just, generally it's because they claim to be vice president of uh, U.S. National Bank, but they're also vice president of Wachovia, and they're also uh, vice well, president of all these other big... They wear many hats. And so it's, the position is, how can you be vice president of One West Bank and vice president of U.S. National Bank? I mean, that's like an impossibility. You're serving two masters, and it apparently the robo-signers act as some high-level uh, agent of many different financial institutions, and that's what makes them robo-signers. The fact that they sign a lot, and they also don't really have one job. That is correct. And, for, and the other thing is Deborah Brignac, or these robo-signers, they have no personal knowledge of the true facts of the underlying note and the deed of trust and the default processes, or the condition of the default. They just sign it. Why do they do that? Is because this has to be done for the uh, foreclosure process. And the judges buy into this. Well, and the judges probably know about it, but still 
they don't do anything to bring justice because even when the robo signers have been caught committing perjury and testified to the fact that they lied in a deposition where they were under oath, they don't get put in jail or they don't get held in contempt of court. That is correct. Then, um, the same date, um, uh, they, uh, I'm sorry, substitution of the trustee and what they did is that U.S. National Bank as the trustee successor in Wachovia 2004-1 by J.P. Morgan Chase, attorney in, in fact, signed by Deborah Brignac, the same robo-signer, vice president this time of MERS. Now she's a vice president she of MERS. She must make right? an awful lot of money if she's vice president of MERS right. and U.S. National Bank. This is this is the substitution of trustee, which was May 26, 2010, signed by Deborah Brignac, Brignac the same robo signer. And then, um, and then what they did, if you go over to the left, and then notice of sale, but this time what they did, they assigned the um, Flagstar Bank as the uh, original lender to foreclose on this. See, we went back to the same original lender. Because, because they have to. Because they have to. But where did it come from? It came from the wrong trust. Came back to the same original lender. Could they do that? No way on earth could do, they could do this. Now, if this goes to the court, the judges, they're not going to see the whole thing in here. Well, the judge would have to be honest. If the judge is honest, as we've seen in many court cases where the judge is honest, and I'm, we're going to show you some evidence of that, then they hold their feet to the fire and they, then they, uh, they say, you know, you can come back if you can correct all of your errors. It's not that you can't foreclose, but, but, but you thing, have to correct all your errors. But the thing is, though, the, the documents are already recorded. The fraud has already been committed. Yeah, right. So are you going to come back and say, oh, I'm sorry that we made a mistake? I'm sorry we and lied and we They're foreclosing fraud. on somebody's property. And when, when they foreclose... Over 90% of the people, homeowners, they don't fight these cases. So they go to court. The judge, all they see is a notice of trustee sale, assignment of deed of trust, and then an attorney comes in, and the homeowners are usually not there, or if they file for bankruptcy, they're not going to get anywhere anyway. So these cases go through foreclosures that they don't need to be. So what do we need here? We need good lawyers, honest judges, and lawyers who really understand the, uh, the processes of the securitization and the possible frauds that have been committed. Well, let's look at this, some court cases. Okay. And um, here's um, Deutsche Bank National Trust Company. And this is a case you can see this was actually filed, right? This is a copy, of course, but this, this is an actual court case. In the Court of Common Pleas, Claremont County, Ohio, the defendant's matter came before the court for a bench trial and a case ordered dismissed for lack of subject matter jurisdiction findings of fact. And we go down to the defendant, Stephen M. Feck, applied for a loan, right, to finance his house. The defendant voluntarily executed an adjustable rate promissory note. The mortgage securing payment of the note, the mortgage was recorded in the county recorder's office. Defendant Steve Pe uh, Feck ceased making payments on the note. Well, this is a pretty common story. Steve Feck is not currently making payments on the note. The defendants reside at the property. I mean, he's still living in it. Defendants receive mail at the property. That's important because receiving mail establishes that you're, you know, living there and a resident. And the t and the plaintiff, which was the bank, proceeded with presenting testimony uh, of Christopher Spradling. Spradling is a representative of Litton Loan Servicing. 
Litton acted as servicer for the GSAMP Trust. Now, what do we know about that? Well, that's the it's uh, a pool. Pool. That's the pool. Right. <clears throat> and the securitized trust under which the plaintiff served as trustee and into which the mortgage loan at issue was allegedly placed in November 1, 2005. Spradling testified that Litton, that's the servicer for the pool, in its role as servicer was not responsible for keeping the original loan file, presumably containing the original subject note. Now, what do we know about that? If you don't have the note and the deed together, and you can swear that it never, they never were separated, then you have no right to foreclose. Plaintiff produced the original note at and mortgage at trial. So somehow they dug up the original. By way of an allonge on the original note, the note was at some point transferred from South Star Funding, who would be what? The originator. The originator who probably is on the deed of trust as the, uh, the lender. lender. By blank endorsement. What's that? Well, they, this is a norm, they, they, they do this normally when, when they transfer, they sell the note along the securitization process, they endorse it in blank to be filled out just before foreclosure. And the endorsement is pay to the order and then it's just then blank, blank so you could so, fill in the, so any name you wanted. It becomes a bearer, bearer type bond. In instrument. Now, is it illegal to change that, a, a promissory note? Yeah, you can't add words to it. The promissory note is I promise to pay and I sign my name to it and stuff like that. The bank can't come along later and change it but if they sell it to somebody else, they have to. Um, if you're going to, the minute you put the minute you put pay to the order of, it becomes a negotiable instrument, instrument. and right. it has value. And what's its value? If it's a five hundred thousand dollar note, it's worth five hundred thousand. The minute you right. put pay to the order on it, right? So they would have to credit you five hundred thousand because it's your instrument, right? And this is the real problem. The mortgage was assigned to the plaintiff by an instrument dated April 21st, 2008, and recorded at the Claremont County Recorder's Office. Conclusions of law, one, when an instrument is endorsed in blank, it becomes payable to the bearer and may be negotiated by transfer of possession alone. In other words, if you find somebody's check that they dropped out of their pocket and it says pay to cash, you have authority yeah, to cash it. Right. They don't even have, can't even ask you your name. Back to number two. Uh, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 17A requires that all actions be prosecuted in the name of the real party in interest. The real party in interest is the party who has been wronged, who has a, a, a suffered a loss or personal injury. Three, where a party lacks a real interest in the subject matter of the action, it lacks standing to invoke the court's jurisdiction. And then they provide the cases there. Four, the holder of rights or interest in property is a necessary part to a foreclosure action. In other words, you, you have to be the one with the right to foreclose. Otherwise, you can't um, proceed with a foreclosure action. It's an interesting era that we're going through, but I think the truth will prevail um, given the right time and um, perseverance on the part of the homeowners, and I think we will um, come out with a positive results in this.